This is episode 93 of Cellular Healing TV, and uh, we have a really special guest for you today. First of all, of course, we have Dr. Daniel Pampa, cellular healing expert, and we are also welcoming Dan Howard, who is an environmental uh, expert. And uh, we're going to really specifically be sharing a lot on mold and mold remediation and uh, and some of those um, those issues surrounding that and just um, and that, that whole topic. So we're, we're really excited to have um, Dan Howard on the show today. So uh, first of all, though, how are you doing, Dr. Pampa? Oh, I'm doing great. Awesome. And before I, I introduce um, Dan Howard, I just wanted to read a little bit um, about him and, and share some of his background with you because he's just such such an expert in this mold and or <laughs> in this field uh, and specifically on mold and just has has a lot to share with us. Just is a wealth of knowledge on this topic. So um, so Dan Howard is the founder of uh, Howard Testing and Inspections LLC, which is the uh, Pittsburgh's premier mold an environmental firm. So right here in our area, he's, uh, he's serving a lot of people. And um, he was raised in and managed the family uh, custom remodeling and construction business. So um, very few, if any, uh, inspectors can match Dan's experience in education. So he's certified um, in Pennsylvania as a radon pest and a mold assessor and an allergen assessor as well. Um, Dan is nationally recognized as an instructor and lecturer um, who's taught lectures for members of each of the three largest home inspection associations and has taught classes nationally and internationally. Uh, so, so much experience in this field. Uh, thank you so much, Dan, for, for joining the call. And I would just like to welcome you here. It's my pleasure to be with you. Yeah, and I have to say this, Dan, you know, when I practiced in Pittsburgh, you were our go-to guy. Uh, you know, if we thought that Somebody was having uh, mold issues in their home, man. We we called Dan Howard. Uh, matter of fact, I think I think most of my patients from the past are still using Dan Howard. How do I know that? Because I get emails, you know, and uh, you know, you you really have become the expert, uh, not just in that area, but now now nationally. And you know, we thank you for some of the articles, you know, that you we have shared of yours, you know, on these uh, topics of environmental sickness which so many people have today. And Dan, I have to say, most people don't even realize that their home is making them sick. So one of the first questions I have is, you know, what, what's going on? Why, why is mold become an epidemic or even multiple chemical sensitivity? And, you know, what's happening with homes today? Well, we really did this to ourselves in, in the way we've changed how construction is. And, and we evolved to not live in things like terrariums that would now build our houses and change them so they're very similar. I mean, if you remember whenever you were a kid, and it'd be in pool, and they'd dump a couple of teaspoons or tablespoons of water into the little glass aquarium, and, and then in the spring it's still green and moldy. When we do what we do in sealing our houses up, and particularly on the new places uh, with Energy Star ratings, uh, we make it so that there's no fresh air. And, and in the normal days of uh, what we do, we breathe, we, we sweat, we perspire, we wash, some people cook. Um, and all of those things bring moisture into the into into a building, into the area. And just like that terrarium, you need to get that moisture out. But when we decided that we were going to make it, we didn't lose any energy. We made it that we weren't going to let water vapor to escape. And then the other thing we did is we're in the world, in the world of plastics. We've added so many chemicals that just weren't even invented five, ten, fifteen years ago, and they're off gassing into our homes. And, and, and as I learned from you, because we've worked hand in hand so long, you try to you try to clean up the mess. I try to stop the mess from happening in the first place when I work with the patient. And without fresh air, the toxins build up, and and all of those things are adding up. It isn't just the mold; it's the chemicals. It's, it's all of the other things that we do. And you know, and, 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 and unfortunately, and again, this is in your backyard. But the unhealthy things we eat make that even worse. So. We've tightened our houses. Uh, we, we, we consider we put windows in that don't leak here, and that's an improvement. Or we over insulate. Or um, a quick example, whenever we put our high efficiency furnaces in, the old furnaces, whenever you turned them on, the warm air from the house went through the burners up the chimney. Now we get the combustion air from outside, so we're not even moving air through the house using our furnace. And uh, that, it, it's just the laws of the universe. The water goes up, it gets cold, it comes down and drains. Isn't that a beautiful thing? 
Um, we need to disperse toxins. I mean, that's really important. The old timers used to say that pollution, pollution, pollution. We don't have any dilution in our house. Right. And we've just created all these ways to make people sick. Thank well, goodness you're there to fix it. You go to Europe, you know, and you see these buildings that are not just hundreds of years old, but oftentimes thousands. <laughs> it's so, Dan, why? I mean, why are, how could they not have mold? And yet they don't have mold, right? Oh, yeah. And, 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 it, and it's funny. I've, I've gone into million dollar houses, three quarter million dollar houses, not even built, and they're now moldy because of what we're doing. And you went far. It's gone too far. No, I know Aaron Brockovich built a brand new house and uh, literally brand new, and she got sick. She got sick in, in the home. I, it was ironic that it was Aaron Brockovich. Uh, you know, um, <laughs> it, you watch the movie, right? She exposed the whole chemical company, right? Saved a lot of lives. I mean, no doubt. And here she ends up sick because um, of a new home she builds. And I'll tell you, you know, there's uh, there's been many of those cases. Brand new home. And, you know, Dan, I mean, I think what happens is is that they seal it and the, a lot of the wood is still carrying all the moisture because whether it rained or what happened, they seal in the moisture and what happens? Mold forms, right? I always say that mold's all around us. All we have to do is add water and give it a little food. So any place, again, there's laws of the universe. Any place there's food and water, highest mountain, deep and sea, north pole and south pole, and all in betwixt, there's food and water, it'll grow. Finished basement. One of those things that we had is the same deal. Moisture behind the wall. Yeah, that's well, good. I, I always say if the, if you have water in your basement, there's mold. Is that a pretty safe uh, assumption? Well, either that or else you put so many toxic chemicals in that you killed it. But yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm mean, okay. So let, let's let's look at that. And I and I, I know Meredith has some you know pressing questions as well. But you know. I think that people watching this show, of what we did a past show on mold, um, Meredith, you could figure out what some of those episodes were to tell the folks, right? I mean, because, you know, we talked about some testing that we do, a visual contrast sensitivity test and some other tests to, to look at if someone is biotoxically ill, which mold produces a biotoxin. So we're not talking about mold allergies here. Uh, we're talking about literally a biotoxin that makes people very, very sick. So... You know, people watching this are going to say, well, gosh, how do I know if my home's moldy or not? You know, that's the thing. We understand we're creating homes that are sealed in, locked in, locking in moisture, locking in chemicals. Oh, and by the way, we put drywall up, which has cellulose, which is paper on the drywall, which is the perfect food. Am I right for mold? Just add water? Yeah, perfect scenario to create mold. However, most people, Dan, I rarely ever see mold, and if you've been in the house long enough, you rarely smell it. Now, I walk in those homes, I go, this is a mold trap. <laughs> you know, oh. I smell it, but yet you can't see it typically, you can't smell it typically. How do we know? Well, and again, what you said, some people can smell it, some people cannot. Uh, the good news for me is I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, the, like the, the, the mold dog, I walk in, and because I've been doing this so long, I do smell it, but, but the important part the absolute important part is the test part. And there's a whole bunch of different ways we can test. Um, the easiest, uh, least expensive test is air testing. Um, and what we're testing for is spores floating in the air. Um, that's a good indicator is, and it's very similar to if, if I wanted to know how many tomato plants I had in the field, and like, let's say got 100 bushels to dwell in, each plant typically makes a, 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 a bushel of tomatoes, so we figure out that we have so much mold. And, Whenever we do air testing, we get both the amount that's there and the type. And the type tells someone that's skilled where it's coming from, where, where the source is, and, we'll, and, and gives you information on where to look for what, what, what's going on there. If we have a situation, you mentioned biotoxins, the endotoxins, mycotoxins, biotoxins that make people sick. We even have testing that can tell that, and it can tell the other chemicals that are in a place. So what is the that? And, and that's an expensive form of testing. But if we have somebody that's really ill, it can tell us that. If we have someone with a particular disease, um, and we, can, we can very often do viable testing, which means that we put it in a petri dish and then you can speciate. You know, we know what species, the species of mold is and you can relate that to the illness. Um, one of the amazing things that, that, that just has me shaking my head is 
of course, uh, in Pittsburgh, they shut down one of the country's best transplant uh, programs because of mold that's sitting in the I see in, in the intensive care unit post post surgery and people were dying from it. Wow. And, and, when they, and at one point they said they had 1,300 people on the waiting list and they just canceled the program. The funny thing is, is they got it, they knew it, they understood it. But you know, whenever they send people home, they don't test the houses for mold when they send those patients home. And I scratch my head. I've had a couple of their patients that actually had mold issues, and it can kill them. Um, particular mold aspergillus. Whenever you're on immunosuppressant drugs, it grows in their lungs like like the petri dish. Mm -hmm. So the, testing is really important, and, and and more critical is having the testing done by somebody who knows the relationship between health and the exposure and what type of mold it is. Right. Yeah. I mean, do you, go ahead, Meredith. Well, I was just saying, are you referring to black mold? That's that's the one that we hear a lot about as being fatal. So could you kind of explain the differences? Um, well, black mold is, is, con is, the, is the common name attached to docubotrys, and, and that can cross your lungs and, and infect your blood, and, and of course cause serious health issues in some people. But the mold I was just mentioning that, that grows grows like weeds in, a, in, a, in, a, in the lungs of someone who's had transplant is aspergillus. You get aspergillosis. There are molds that will, if you're susceptible to it, eat eye tissue, damage eye tissue. There's stuff that People who have had skin issues for years, and it's a particular type of mold that's in their home. It goes so far beyond the black mold that we usually hear about, and there are so many different things that can be triggered. And, and again, as, as you folks absolutely know, whenever your, your immune system is, is weakened, you're subject to all of these. So I've seen everybody with people with respiratory issues, skin issues, eye issues, all related to particular molds. Um, I, I had one client, I've had more than one, but one in particular that MS had set in and and they were just amazed at her age and how fast it was progressing. Well, it turns out that mold ketonian can aggravate and trigger that disease and that's what she had. It wasn't stuff in the box, it was the mold ketonian. And whenever I got the lab results back, and I'm looking, I'm saying, now I know why your doctor's saying you're progressing so quickly. Let's get you out of this. Let's get this fixed. So, so, so it's a lot more complex than what we know from the news. But, but what is it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. No doubt. I mean, I, I see the the look. We we call mold is one of the I call it one of the three amigos, the big boys that can t knock you down so fast that it can lead to major major diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, autoimmune diseases, and unexplainable illnesses. You know, heavy metals, mold, and hidden infections. <laughs> you know, these oh, yeah. these are the three that really are not your average toxin. So, you know, hearing you seeing these clients of yours with these illnesses, well, it sure doesn't surprise me because when I see somebody that is has unexplainable set of symptoms or conditions, that w these three things we look at first. Heavy metals, biotoxins from mold or lime, and other hidden infections, you know, that can occur even in the mouth. So, yeah, we, we get that. So on the, the testing then, I mean, there's one called an ERMI test that people use. It's, you know, looking at the dust and things in the house. Um, you mentioned a, a different type of air test and even a test that looks at biotoxins. Can we give some names on some of those tests so people at home can write them down? Well, the ERMI test we mentioned is one that shows a great history of what's going on in the home. And, and it's... And because you're collecting the dust, it's not just what's in the air today, it's been what you've been exposed to over the last couple of years. And they, they look at the top, the top allergen creating uh, molds and they look for, for pet and stuff like that. And, and if you have someone that's being highly allergenic and it's, they've lived in the home a long time, it's a great test to, to use. Um, there's only four labs in the country that, are, that process it. Um, the one that I use that's very good at that is DMSL. Um, great test. Um, air test, which we use spore traps. Um, what it does is it captures what's floating in the air. And, and the best analogy I can give is if I have red balls, blue balls, and green balls, and I throw them into your living room. That's pretty much a random event. If I count how many are in half the room and multiply it times two, I know how much is in the room. If I take the, take, take a, a, a quarter of the room and multiply it times four, I know how much is 
in the room. What it does is they have a slide and it collects a representative sample of so many liters of air on the slide, and then from that they can extrapolate what's floating in the air today in real time. And that's a great test. If we have something that is one of the wet molds, and you mentioned Stachyobotrys, and the, the mold I mentioned, Catonia is a wet mold. They hide, they hide behind walls. You almost never see them. They produce very few spores. But if I see that type of mold in a place, what I do is I swab that. Um, the problem is, is that it's like pond plants are to the plant world. The, the allergenic ones are more like grass and trees and moderate amount of moisture. So those need a tremendous amount of moisture, and they just don't produce a lot of spores. It'd be like the tomato plant that only made one tomato a year. Um, so we swab that or tape lift it, and then they can look and examine what it is there. Um, that's what a lot of people think of whenever they think mold testing, um, but it's only representative of the spot. Right. But, you know, a lot of the molds you pointed out are behind the walls. I mean, how right. do we know? I mean, how do you know to get there? I mean, in other words, great. Uh, you know, how, how do we know that wall? I look at all these walls in my house. So how do I figure out what wall to go behind? That means cutting a hole in the drywall as well. And then, then you're visibly looking for it, therefore, to test it. And, and normally what, what you would do is if we find some of those hidden molds, first of all, um, one of the tools we can use in for a camera that can sometimes tell us whether there's an accumulation of moisture or high humidity and that's helpful. Hey, uh, infrared camera, you look at the wall with an infrared camera. And, and that's helpful, but it's not, not the end story. Um, a good solution is cutting at the floor, the height of the baseboard, and then you pull that behind, and that's usually a pretty good indicator of which wall is our problem. Then you can expose those and clean those areas. Uh, so it's a good sorting tool. I mean, that's a physical thing. Um, if I have an area that I kind of want to know and I'm suspecting that um, for instance, one last week they had an area for a bathtub and they just closed it off with drywall. Well, we have little tubes and, and with a 3 8 inch hole, I can shove the tube in and actually get a sample of what's behind that particular wall. So that test works real well. Um, again, there's a whole set of tools that if you have somebody who's experienced and, 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 and knows, knows what to do in what application, it's just like any other set of tools. It's, Kind of like when someone comes to you, that you, you sort through what's going on and apply what techniques you do. But you have to start with 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 figuring out what it is they're reacting to, and then kind of going from there. Well, I can look. Look, I'm no home inspector. You used to do that for years. I can look at a home and go, okay, that wall right there is in question. You know, because I can see that out from the outside, there's a hill running down. It's putting you know water into that wall. It's only a matter of time before that water is going to get through. I don't care what they have on the other side of it because it's under positive pressure from water. Water wins all the time. So I mean, yeah. So I look at a house from the I look at the assessment from the outside first. You know, right. then I give it my nose test. You know, then I can bring from there an expert in that would look at it. You know, and say, okay, you know, these walls are problems. Maybe we should test behind these walls. You know, Dan, I mean, I, I think people asking are going to be like, okay, great, you're in the Pittsburgh area. Um, you know, how do they find someone that has your expertise in their area? I mean, how do, what do they look for? That's, how do about that's a real good question. Um, and I've been searching, um, just like I know that you've worked and trained people across the country. Um, I've come across uh, a company, Test All, um, and people can go to my website and get information. Um, give, give your website, and Meredith, you can write it down and show it. Um, and uh, what, it, what it is is they've done an excellent job of training people on first going through the outside, sorting through what those issues are, going through the inside. Um, real often when you just call someone or, or untrained bulk home inspectors, they come in to take the air sample, they don't do the investigation. When I'm in a house, it's typically two hours or more, they just come in and test. And that's the question you really asked me. You said, yeah. you, know, you know enough to look around, why don't most of the inspectors? Um, I've actually sat through their training programs and, and have added, um, given them, the set of issues that I look at that they've, they've put into a set of software so it tickles the people who weren't experienced at this because there's no replacement for experience to look for outside water, down spots, their separation where the driveway goes, and work through the whole thing through the, through the inside. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty happy with their training program. Again, I sat 
and, and took their, their class, they're, they're showing new people, they're giving the new people just to make sure that what I'm seeing is what I'm seeing. And uh, they're for real. Um, they've partnered with the InterNACHI, the National Association, the National Association of Home Inspectors, um, that, and, and they're developing a relationship with people that are selected from that to train. So it's kind of a good system. They've got a source of 10,000 inspectors to pick from. They've got a good training program. Um, and, and if you weren't in the Pittsburgh area, that would probably be the best source. And okay, give, give Meredith, write down, write down his website, and then maybe we can get that website uh, to write that down. Right. And, and in fact, uh, I think I'll put on my, my website all the links so that your people can go to, to those places. Okay. All right, so give, give your website so Meredith can display it. The easy one is pittsburghmoldtesting.com. Okay, pittsburghmoldtesting.com, and we will type that up and have that displayed on the screen. So pittsburghmoldtesting.com, and then you'll have links there to anyone that you would recommend for more information and for someone to find a, a proper inspector in their area. Absolutely. Great. Good. We'll, just do, we'll just do a page. I have to say, I mean, folks, read, go to the website. He has great articles there, um, and, you know, there's some great sources. So... Uh, you know, that's a, a really good source for people to educate themselves on these topics. Uh, you know, no doubt. Meredith, I know you had a couple other questions too. I do. I have a number of questions actually. If we can backtrack and I don't know if it'll be in the proper order, but um, I do. So, and well, I just kind of wanted to backtrack too when you were talking about the process. I'm wondering when you're remediating mold, once you find the mold, discover that it is in the home. How do you clean it? Yeah. What what happens? Well, and again, this this is where it gets real tricky, and I really get frustrated. And I know that in working with Dr. Pompa, he's been frustrated with. Um, if I every, every morning when my wife and I go to breakfast, we wipe down the countertop, we wipe down the the, the the kitchen table, and all those things. If your approach is to just take the mold and wipe it away, um, you've got the problem that we have tomorrow morning. The activity daily living, you get germs, bacteria, and all types of things on the countertop. So the treatment has to match the need, uh, what the circumstances are, where the mold is there. Plus, more importantly, it has, you have, again, the, if you ran the science experiment and you have mold growing behind a wall, you've got to change the conditions or right after treatment, just like after we wipe down the kitchen counter, the mold will come back. So the trick here is to find a remediator who will end up treating it and also addressing the issues that are underlying, which is why it's important to have an inspector who understands the underlying conditions. And this all goes hand in hand. You need, you need, and there are very inexpensive people who will come do and what we in the trade call spray and pray. They just put a coat of whatever it is that they are using, one of the yeah. one of the chemicals, some are peroxide based, some are um, you know one is one is just PSP. They make it into a into a solution, try to study the phosphate. Um, you need to have somebody address the underlying issues where you'll get the same results and someone who will actually treat every area that does. And it all starts with the initial assessment, which is, again, what I do. You don't want somebody coming in and doing uh, a 15-minute take the test, see you later thing. Mm -hmm. you, get so you don't actually do the cleaning of the mold. You just assess it initially, and then someone else comes in does the cleaning. That's correct. You don't want to you really don't want to your tester being the remediator. That's a, a comp, it's like sending the, the, the fox into the hen house. Hey, how many hens you got in there? Um, yeah. You just don't do that. No. No, but you're right. I mean, it's very frustrating. These people, they do. They just come in and wipe the counters, so to speak. Um, and, hey, all the mold's gone, right? It's like they've done nothing to change the cause of why the mold's there. They've done nothing to really, you know, even get it deep enough. Uh, you know, these mold, the roots go into the cement block, into the wood, and you hit it with Clorox on the outside, uh, and arguably you've made your problem worse because the, the water that's naturally in Clorox or whatever it is goes down and feeds the roots, and you killed the mold on the outside only to come up with more vengeance later. Uh, you know, I, I've watched that take place. Or they come in with their toxic concoctions and start spraying things, and people then end up, you know, with a, a, a new problem. They end up with chemical sensitivity based on the poison they use to kill it. <laughs> so, multiple problems there, Dan. So, again, 
how does somebody find someone who remediates safely? Does that organization have some contacts there? Um, as, a, as a separate organization, I like what they do. Um, uh, as Green Home Solutions, they have a pretty good approach to following protocols. Um, and they have, it's, it's a franchise system, that, and their training seems darn good. I've, I've spoken to their uh, chief science officer um, who actually develops for them the protocol. And, it, and they take the approach of, yeah, we need to clean it, we need to change the environment. Um, and I'll, I'll put that up on the links for mine, but it's greenhomesolutions.com. It green, uh, green white solutions.com. And uh, I've had some good success working with them. Uh, and I like what they do. Yeah. Again, the problem is, can you find a name across the country that, that you know is fairly conscientious? And, and that's a tough thing. Uh, yeah. So I'm looking for someone who has good training and uh, cleans up the mess whenever they're if they have a rogue uh, franchisee. Well, one of the things that I look for is, you know, do they c create a containment? <clears throat> if a company comes in to clean up mold and you don't see them putting up plastic walls in tubes coming out that are sucking air out, creating a, a negative pressure, so the biotoxins don't end up in the HVAC and throughout your entire home. If you don't see this containment set up, in, in one of the past episodes, on mold, we showed Warren's containment and how um, it was pulling the, creating this negative air pressure uh, that pulled the stuff out because you can make problems worse. You know, oh, I have yeah. many of people who get more sick after cleaning up mold because they never did it correctly from the beginning. So that's one thing that I look for, whether it's being done correctly. Are there other things? Well, you did that, and let me give you the analogy so people picture what's going on. Remember as a kid that the dandelion went from yellow to white? Yeah. Blue on it, went everywhere? That's what happens when you treat mold. And you need to do a couple things. One of them is containment. That means you put the plastic up and you keep it from going places. And I've, and I've caught remediators not, remediators not sealing off the furnace, too. Well, that's circulating air through the place. That's step one, containment. Then you need negative air. That's the exhaust. That's the exhaust that... It's the pipe like when the E.T. movie and you have the plastic and it pushes the air out the window. Um, and then you do what's called air scrubbing. Air scrubbing is you bring in a filter that constantly circulates the air. And, and think of it like whenever that whenever you blew on that white white colored dandelion that it's floating down. Well, if it hits the floor, then you walk on it, it goes back up in the air. The air scrubber grabs what's in the air. So so that's the process. You want a containment, you want negative air, and you want it, you want it to the air scrub. Yeah, well, that's good. That gives people at least an idea of, you know, uh, are they doing it right? And, again, I, I would add one more to that. Again, and you kind of said this earlier, you know, are they assessing the situation to say, wait a minute, you've got positive water pressure on the outside of this wall, so if we do all this and not fix that, then really you're going to end up in the same problem, you know, months down the road. So, you know, that means possibly excavating the yard so it slopes down on the outside. Uh, it may need a new French drain. I, I don't know, but you know, where are your gutters running? Do you need new gutters? Water and what it's doing on the outside typically creates the problem. Maybe you have to every once in a while, how many years, Dan, you're an inspector, do you have to have your houses recocked? I can't tell you how many people's homes leak because it's just old cracked caulking. Um, so um, give them some advice on that. Well, I'm going to hit on one that, you, one that you mentioned. Most people think that if they put an interior French drain to stop the water to stop the mold. No, what you've done is stop the symptoms of seeing the water going through the through the block wall. If the water is going and soaking the, the the soil underneath the floor, that's where the wet molds, the ones that are toxic, like like the botrytis, chamomile, those molds we talk live in. So I go into many places where they've spent thousands of dollars to supposedly dry the basement, and the basement's moldier and smaller than ever. Um, now, there are some of the interior French drain people now who have caught on to that and they do what's called a sealed system. They seal the top and they put, a, put an exhaust system into this so that the moisture instead of going into the house and the mold spores instead of going into the house go outside. So that's one solution. But, but you really did touch on, on one of the most common things that people do wrong by putting in French drain. You have soil, you want to make sure that you cover. Um, they make they make systems. Yeah, wet wet dirt. If you've ever stuck your head in a crawl space, you know it'll grow mold. Um, they make barrier systems that you can put on it. And again, you put an exhaust system underneath. It works very similar to a radon system. 
and you can get some moisture in the mold out from that area. Um, there are a lot of tricks that can be done, but sadly, in a lot of places, if you're not getting advice from the right people, they're going to do what they do every day and not what solves your moisture problem. And sometimes you need to find a way to get fresh air into the place. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll get to solutions because that's one thing I always do is I make sure there's, you know, fresh air being able to be brought into the home and toxic air out. Is there a, a, a yeah, absolutely. Is there a test you can do to test the toxins in the home that you do? Well, again, the, the TO15, when I have people sick, and I, and, and I truly have clients that have moved into their house and one week, two weeks, three weeks, a month later they're sick and having to move out, uh, the TO15 is a, uh, is a canister that goes in that they put an absolute vacuum into it, you open it up, pull the air into it, then we send it back to the lab and cryogenically freeze it and they put in a mass spectrograph and they can actually identify which toxins are in the air. And it's wonderful. I mean, actually what's funny is whenever I'm talking over the lab results of the lab, they can tell me, well, you know, it looks like that was a high traffic area because there are a lot of products from gasoline in there. Or there's a lot from this and this that was typically found in paint. Um, one of the most innocuous ones is acetyl nitrile and that nobody expects to find that chemical in a house. But the funny part, Part is, is whenever you do hardwood floors, if they don't cure it right, that'll go in and that can make people sick. Wow. There's so many different illnesses. Oh, formaldehyde used to help uh, the lumber liquidator uh, story. That's, that's, that wasn't a made up story. I, I've had clients that we've tested for and they're really sick in the house because of the formaldehyde that's in some of that flooring. Um, and and that's that for that type of testing, we use what's called a dragger tube. The problem with formaldehyde is the chemical is one of the smallest, simplest chains of organic you know, carbon and hydrogen. And it doesn't, doesn't often get identified on the TO15, but I can do a little glass tube type of test that has a polyester fabric in it, chemical absorbent, and they can tell me whether they have so much formaldehyde in the place that it's toxic and it's happening. You have Chinese drywall. There's a test that I can do for that. That um, again, it'll tell me whether they have the sulfur products. And you would be shocked. You would be amazed if you saw what that drywall does in the house to the metals, much less what it does to the people. I mean, I've opened up outlets and seen that the coppers turn green from all of the sulfur products in the air. It's nuts, and people are getting sick on this. Wow, those are some major major pitfalls. Can someone uh, get one of those TL15 tests? Can you send them to somebody and tell them where to put them, then send them back to you and look? It, it, it really should be handled um, by somebody who knows what they're doing. All right. It really needs to be the conditions. So when you're talking an expensive test, you really want the conditions right. Right. It's just not a good one. To, it's not a good one for, for self you don't, you don't do that kind of test. I mean, you like asking. Somebody will be you and use the MRI equipment. Oh, yeah, you probably could, but yeah, not a good idea. Yeah, not a good idea. Yeah, your sound kind of got a little bit. Yeah, can't quite hear everything. If you can speak a little more, a little more loudly and clearly. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Um, well, I'm thinking, too, across the country, there are probably some areas that are much more susceptible to, to mold damage than others. I, I lived in New Orleans for years, post-Katrina, in a home that had six feet of water right. during the storm. So I, I know I had some, some mold exposure there. But if you can kind of talk a little bit about um, you know, some areas in the country where people are a lot more susceptible um, so they could kind of be aware. Well, it's, it's a lot of event-driven and weather-driven. Um, in addition to being construction driven, and you mentioned one that was absolutely perfect. Um, the Katrina problem, of course, was, was complicated not just by the fact that places got flooded, but they got flooded with water that, that had, been, had been contaminated by sewage, which is a perfect food for mold, and more importantly, it set viruses and all types of other illnesses, whether it be MERS or like living in people's homes, hepatitis. Um, so, so, and, 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 so you would have a different set of molds than you would in just a normal wet place. Um, some of the worst areas for mold are Texas and Florida and those kinds of wet environments. Um, but, but housing has a lot to do with it too. I mean, yeah. just the way something's built. And being new or being old, either way could be a problem. Older homes, it's often with sandstone foundations. The water wicks through it all the time. 
um, new houses, of course, because they're too tight. Um, houses that, I mean, there, there are things like that you can do to make a house be a mold problem that you'd never think of. Let me give you one example. If you change out the air conditioner, the an air conditioner that is oversized for the house, then it runs a short time, leaves water in the ductwork in the basement, it'll condense, just like the ice water on the 4th of July, and leak through and, and get your drywall and walls and your ceilings in your basement. So even doing something like putting too large an air conditioning system into a house could be an issue. Um, and other conditions around that which just popped into the mind is, is that if you put a new furnace in and they don't have to take care of venting a gas hot water tank correctly, you have what's called an orphan hot water tank, which means the combusting gases, the first one of which is water vapor, don't leak, and you can have mold growing on a ceiling above where a hot water tank has been there for 30 years and never been a problem simply because you put the new furnace in and didn't put a smaller vent in to accommodate the lower heat of the hot water tank alone. Uh, it's a complicated issue, um, and the funny part is probably 20 to 25 percent of the new furnace installs I see in this area, they don't deal with the hot water tank venting properly, and so they're setting it up. And all you need is is some house on the verge of growing mold. I mean, we we go up over 45 percent relative humidity and grows, and you add one factor like that, or a factor like stuffing too much insulation in the attic so that the water vapor doesn't leave, and now all of a sudden you've got a house that is moldy because of that. If, if we, and again, venting, if you talk to different geographies, the area of the country where that is, is a, the different things you do in those areas, whether it be heating or cooling, like the South would have the tendency more to have oversized air conditioners because they, the salesman for the air conditioning company says, well, you about to go the next size up, you'll know you'll always be cool real quick. Well, yeah, but then you have condensation on it. Do you have, do you, on your website, do you have a list of these things that people can look for? I mean, you mentioned, you know, putting too much insulation in your ceiling. Now, water vapor doesn't get through. It increases moisture. You mentioned not venting the, the, the hot water tank properly, even too big or too small events. I mean, okay, you know, I, I'm leaving this conversation going, you know, I, I just want to run around checking my own home. I, I want a list of these pitfalls. I want a list of, you know, these are the things you have to look at. Well, the set of articles I have deal with these these in, in a semblance of a little bit at a time because each one needs an explanation. Um, and one just popped in my head because right now as we're recording, we're near Christmas. I've had people get sick because they thought. They absolutely thought and believed that by not bringing a live tree in, they're not going to get their allergies in winter whenever the tree comes in and they're allergic to it, right? Except that if you take that tree and those decorations and you store them in the attic and your attic has pollen, your attic has mold, and you bring the stuff down, then you're right where you were with the real tree. So I have an article just talking about how to store your Christmas things and what to do and what to be careful when you're bringing them out. And, and well, again, if you can solve it, all you do is you take the, the, all the different greenery things that you have that are plastic, take them into the garage and hose them down. But, I've had people call me and say they're sick at Christmas time and wondering why. Um, that's its own article. Uh, again, it's it's a it's a library of things, and, and bless the person that wants to read all of them. Um, it's there. It's there for the taking, and and it's free. Um, but even so, there's nothing that can replace having someone who actually understands how a house works, somebody who understands building science and the environmental science to come to your place. Yeah, I mean, who would think, you know, too big of an air conditioner, you know, it's like, and uh, that creates a whole other problem. And I'll tell you, in Florida, uh, you know, 90% of the buildings that I walk in, I go, mold, you know, and it's most of it from the, the air conditioning, right? I mean, it's uh, from the coil, I'm sure, and the molds, you know, building up in these units. Well, plus, plus uh, if it turns on in short cycles, you know, the ductwork closest to the plenum, closest to the place that does the work, is coldest. And that's usually the lower level of the building. Sometimes it's up on the rooftop. And if it's on the rooftop, it could be that it's just a humid day. And that's where it collects. And then you have a little bit of dirt, because there's always dirt in ductwork. And bingo, bango, you have the perfect food and the, and the water. Again, any place on Earth, there's food and water, something will grow. And, 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 and it's often done with the 
installer thinking you're doing you a favor by putting something in so you're never going to be hot. You just don't know. Yeah, I mean, uh, no doubt. You know, I, it sounds like you should keep your. I always like to keep my fans on. Absolutely. Co constantly, the the air circulating. It's like running water, right? Running right. water doesn't form mold. It's when it's hit and miss. <laughs> that's what. Well, if you have a forced air furnace, that's the best idea, no matter the time of year, because the, the actual humidity from your lower level it dissipates it and it keeps it even. And in summer, when you're running air conditioner, it avoids that problem of cold duct work and a cold plenum that's going to land up being moldy. You are absolutely 100% on with it. Yeah. Well, okay, so let, let's talk about some solutions that people can do right away to make their home safer. One of the things that I do is put in an ERV system in, an energy return ventilator, which just brings fresh air in and bad air out. Any other suggestions? Well, that's, that's probably the best one that gets, that, that gets ignored, um, and it is easy to do. Uh, bottom line is the solution to pollution is solution, like we said earlier, if I take a cup of oil, put in a gallon of water, it's Pretty bad. I put it in a drum of water, not, not so bad. And if you could take the toxins and air them out, particularly on new housing, you're ahead of the game. That's a super thing to do. If you have a house that's too damp, instead of putting little dehumidifiers in, you can put one at central. Vapor Air, which makes the one that used, they used to make, there's a name known for adding humidity to a, to a, to a furnace, also makes a whole house humidity, humidity control, which uh, will, will keep the air drier for the entire house. If you can't do that, it's usually about $2,000 installed for that equipment. If you even take a regular standard dehumidifier, hook it up, take the drain out the back instead of emptying it because most people, I know I'm not going to think of the first thing in the morning, go empty it, the last thing to empty it. Just hook up the hose, put it to a floor drain, set it for 45% relative humidity, and run it all the time. The only time it turns on is whenever it needs to. You don't waste energy. I had, when I lived in Pittsburgh or you know, anywhere there was humidity, I always had the dehumidifiers constantly going. You know, like you said, making sure that my humidity was, you know, hopefully around 45. Absolutely. There's a lot of things you can do like that. And the other thing is, is plan, plan your improvements and changes in the property with, with all of this in mind. Think about what you're doing whenever you, whenever you, you make the change. Um, it's not, and particularly if, if, you, if you're fighting illness to begin with, it might not be bad to have somebody who actually understands environmental issues and building issues both. Yeah. Come in, I mean, how many days sick do you want to be? I mean, if you pay the fee for someone who actually knows what they're going to come in, it's a whole lot better than feeling ill for weeks, months, yeah. or years. Listen, I, I see R number one of my five R's of how to fix a cell. Look, you, you have to remove the source. The sources that have bioaccumulated from the body, yes. But I'll tell you, if you don't remove the sources from your life, you're never going to get well. It is impossible to get well if you're living in a moldy home. I would say it's impossible to get well if you have silver filling still leaching mercury in your brain every day. You know, these environments, I, the big challenge with many people who are not progressing is that they're in an environment that either is, has too many toxins, like you said, or too much mold. I mean, both are toxins. But... You know, mold and maybe just toxic sources. Like you said, if the floor is not cured properly, you could be putting off too much formaldehyde. I, you know, so much formaldehyde they use in the insulations today. Uh, you know, these things can permeate for years uh, until they off gas. I mean, uh, you know, I, I don't know this floor that's not cured properly. How many years would that take to off gas, Dan? Well, again, the, the whole process is the reason we smell it. The reason it leaves is is at least maybe a 10% a year or whatever the particular rate for that product is. And, it, and, it, and, it, and, and you don't know, it depends on how much was there to begin with and how well it holds. But if it's off-gassing, let's say this year 10% of it leaks. Okay, so next year 10% of the 9% leaks, which leads to the 81%. And the next year 10% of the 81% is going to land up leaking, so on and so forth. So over time, stuff will off-gas. And hopefully you don't bring more of the same thing in by buying new furniture or the like. Um, it really depends on the product. Uh, one of the things that tricks people the most, and I know that you struggle with, people don't understand that they get sick. They're used to thinking real time. I put my hand on the burner, I get I get burnt. I hit my thumb with the hammer, I, I feel. That's not how environmental toxins work. 
and you're stuck with the problem of it doesn't clean up real quick. I'm stuck with the problem whenever I explain to someone, well, yeah, you lived here for five years, but you didn't have pneumonia at that point. You didn't have this other disease, and now all of a sudden you can't handle what's in the house. Um, so we need to do that. Yeah. Um, and people, people go in denial that it's the house. Let me give you the best test I have. If it's a building, um, it might be work, it might be a church, it might be something else. It's the same too, by the way. Um, if you keep track of where you are, when you are, and how you feel, yes, understand that it happens in time. Delay. I'm not going to. If I walk into a building that makes me sick, I'm not going to get sick now. I'm going to get sick four hours from now. Until we get past that, thinking only if I hit my hammer now, that's the hammer. Right. And again, I know that's a struggle that you have, and I, I and I've heard you work with people who just never thought of it that way. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I always tell people, you know, look, when you go into an environment. You know, how do you start to feel? It's typically not an immediate reaction for most people. You know, how do you feel? How are you sleeping? How's your brain fog? You know, how's your aches and pains? You know, it, it's not random. Notice how you feel when you are in an environment, when you leave that environment for an extended period of time. Now, maybe you go on vacation to the beach and that place is even worse. And people say, well, I felt worse when I went. So, of course, you have to assess every environment. But, you know, you should leave the environment enough times that you realize that something happens, certain symptoms occur when you get back into that environment. So uh, that is the best test, Dan. I, I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I, I think that getting some of those other tests, uh, you know, the TL15 and other tests, uh, people should be doing these things for sure. Meredith? Yeah, well, I just had a question too. Obviously, um, these chronic chronic mold issues are, are much more of a problem. But what if someone's had an acute exposure? Maybe this is for Dr. Pomba. What would you suggest? Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, an acute exposure. Some people, you know, that aren't sensitized yet, um, you know, just getting out of the exposure is good enough, and they can uh, their body deals with it, right? Other people are left with some symptoms. You know, the G cell and the bind are great because G cell raises intracellular glutathione, which is how your body naturally tries to get rid of things, downregulate inflammation. Bind actually, these biotoxins make their way into the liver, bind up to bile and the bile is reabsorbed and you bring them around and around, bind actually pulls the biotoxin out of the bile complex. So I would do some heavier doses of G-cell and bind. Even the new one, cytodetox, binds up biotoxin. So you know, adding in some cytodetox is uh, also going to be critical, but we're going to say stay out of the environment. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and I've also thought, too, as you kind of mentioned, some people live in, in moldy homes and don't get sick. Can you explain that? Yeah. Um, they were, I'm sorry. Go yeah, no, no, go ahead, Dan. I was just going to say, and I'll set you up for that, but, uh, you know, I know that Shoemaker talks about, and he's an expert in biotoxin, you know, certain genes make you more susceptible. I'm going to tell you, you know, uh, I, I think genes are always certain things that can get triggered. I don't think genes ever make us sick, very rarely, I should say. But I know that it's really, I believe, it's more people who have other neurotoxic exposures going on. You know, those people are sensitized just waiting for the next hit or the perfect storm. Those are the people that seem to get triggered from mold, um, I think, even before the gene. Um, but anyways, Dan, what's your feelings? Well, my, my, my feelings are 100% are with you. Let me give you one of the worst problems I get is a husband and wife or, or parents and a child, and only one person is sick, and they scratch their head and say it must be the imagination. The example I use, we all know about the earth. There are young folk who can eat one peanut and go and dance left the chalk. There are other people, and most kids could live on PB and G all of PB and J all of their life. The problem is each one of us is individual with the sum of all the exposures. Um, and whenever we're working with other people who don't believe or don't understand that one person in a household could be a problem with, with the health reactions and another one perfectly healthy, um, they need to think of it in that way. The other problem is Real often, if we have one person working inside the home and the other outside the home, I'll often go in and their discussion is, well, I'm, I'm not sick, they're sick. Well, the total time of exposure counts, too, which is something that, that, that Absolutely. Hit on it. it's the amount, of, the amount of exposure you have to that particular toxin plus all of the other toxins in your life. I agree. I, I think it's mostly that. I think it's how full is your bucket full of neurotoxins, stressors. You know, how far is your bucket filled with stressors, physical, chemical, emotional, and it just takes that one more to throw it over the edge, which I call the perfect storm. 
you know, we have, you know, a few stressors going on and, you know, boom, bring in that one more. And then now we have a perfect storm scenario. Uh, you know, does that perfect storm turn on certain genes? Absolutely. I believe the genes are triggered and turned on. You know, I know in Shoemaker's early work and I, you know, he met, looked at the HLA genes and I had doctors running the HLA tests and, you know, I, we just found that really it didn't matter. I, it's, I couldn't correlate it statistically with any one gene um, in accordance to his work, honestly. It, it just seemed like the person who already had too many exposures through a lifetime and bioaccumulated, those are the ones whose bucket overflowed. They ended up with a bunch of symptoms. So and that could be you. You know, it could be the next thing. You know, it took me a lot of mercury vapor from my amalgam fillings you know, in uh, having some mold exposures, all these things happening at the same time, that was it. Uh, I got sick. So, look out. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Very real issues. Wow. Well, it's been some amazing information. Is there anything else, um, Dan, you'd like to add? Um, I think really it's important to find somebody who yeah. understands buildings, understands Look around at things. Don't be satisfied with a 15-minute come in, take a test. You want to know the underlying conditions. If you have to do things to make yourself well, you need to look at the process. Um, you need to work with someone, someone like like Dr. Pompa to get yourself self well because it typically doesn't happen real quickly on your own. Um, and uh, and in finding people in your geographic area, I'll put something up on my website that you'll be able to find them. Um, if you have a particular problem. There are a lot of articles there that would really relate to this that, that I, I would be tickled that you come take a look at and use and benefit from it. Um, I, I, I wish nobody needed my services. I'm glad I'm there to do it. Um, that's very similar to, to again, Dr. Pop. I'm sure if you had a, a uh, magic wand, you'd make everybody well. Um, yeah. It's a good thing you're there. Um, ho hopefully, we can help enough people that uh, um, they live a better life after we're done. You know, it's funny, Dan, I'm sitting here looking at you and I, and, uh, you know, we're, we are the answer to modern-day illness, and I, I don't say it bragging or boasting, meaning that we just, you know, we're, we're looking and dealing with the sources. You know, you, you're, I always say you'll never get well unless you get your environment safe, right? Our, you are our number one on the environmental side. I'm our number two of help, helping people get it out of their body, that, you know, these toxins that bioaccumulate. You know, both of those represent our number one. And if you don't remove the source, folks, uh, you are just, you know, not going to get well. Remove the interference. The body has an ability to heal itself. That's how I got my life back. That's how thousands of others got their life back. And, Dan, you're dealing with a source in homes, which is such a hidden source today. Thank you for the wealth of knowledge you've given. This is an important show. It really is. Because, folks, if you're watching it and you're just not progressing, you know, look to these things in your home. You know, get your homes tested. You know, evaluate every nuance, every chemical, every possible mold exposure in your life, your home, your work, school, whatever it is, because I've seen it time and time again that our environment is making us ill. So, Dan, thank you for the wealth of knowledge. We'll read those articles. It was my pleasure. Let me throw one last one as people are finishing. So often when people have mold problems, they plug the plugins, the odorizers in their little wall, right? <laughs> the vehicle in them is formaldehyde. Terrible. The thing that makes them smell is synthetic esters. So I'll go in and someone's sick in their home from their mold and it made themselves sicker by throwing in all these smelly things oh. so they can't smell the mold. Always. I walk in these homes with these air fresheners, folks. They have on average up to six neurotoxins in these things. I mean, Get unplug, unplug, folks. Literally, get rid of that stuff. Don't hang them in your cars. Don't put them in your homes. It's chemicals. Don't cover up smells. Get to the source. That was great to end the show on that because that is one of my pet peeves, for goodness sakes. I hate air fresheners. <laughs> I go in and I get sick from them, and it's like they're saying, well, why are you sick? I know. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, and how about people wearing the darn air freshener on their clothes, right? It's the bounce, the fabric softeners, you know, and you can smell them a mile away. I would tell these people, I, I wouldn't even allow patients to come in my office in the day. I would be like, okay, you're, you're going to go home now. <laughs> I have too many sensitive people that, you know, can't do that. Oh, gosh, we could talk about toxic sources all day long, right? Uh, Absolutely, and we would never get to all of them. 
<laughs> it doesn't because this is why America is so sick. Toxins drive cellular inflammation. So, you know, our number one, we need safe environments and we got to get the toxins out of our tissue. True cellular detox, you know, that's the answer on our end. So, well, Dan, thank you again. And, uh, you know, just, gosh, we can hope you have you on in the future where we could uh, blow up just even one of these topics. <laughs> so, Absolutely, we could. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you so much. Could you share your website one more time? Pittsburgh is www.pittsburghmoldtesting.com. Pittsburgh is spelled one of those verbs that's spelled with an H. B I T T S T U R G H moldtesting.com. Feel free to use it. Um, lots of people do. We get about 50,000 hits every 90 days. Make 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 yourself available. Uh, and if I can be of help to one person with, with that site, I'm tickled. No, I'm sure you will. Thank you for that. PittsburghMoldTesting.com. You got it, Dan. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for all you do. Send us that Christmas article as well. We'll be happy to share that with our viewers as this time of year. Very, very important Great to know. Idea. Great idea. Thank you, Meredith, for that. Get that article out, no doubt. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Really important message today. Share and, uh, and like this show. Uh, share with your friends and family. And we will see you next week where we will be featuring uh, Professor Thomas Seyfried, and we will be discussing... Uh, cancer and the ketogenic diet and its role in treating big cancer. Show. Big show. Dan, you got to tune in for that. This is a big show. This is a big topic. We'll see you next week, folks. We'll yep. see you. All right. See you next week. Thanks, everyone.